but I could have gone home. <laughs> Pretty much my summer. But to break the ice, because usually when I get behind the phone pit, I get very, very nervous. So I want to tell you a little bit about myself that kind of goes with this sermon. I was a tomboy all my life from the time I was a year old. My, I was a daddy's girl. I watched all John Wayne's movies with him, Gunsmoke, all of them. And when I was five years old, I wanted a gun and poster set for Christmas. My dad and mom decided to buy me a doll. <laughs> well, I unwrapped it, saw it was a doll, threw it down, and continued looking for my gun and poster set, and it wasn't there. So I went in the room with my doll. I cut his hair off. I poked his eyes out, took the clothes off, and brought it back to my mom. And said, where's my gun and holster? That's what I wanted. I was a tomboy up until I probably got 13 years old. I played cowboy Indians with all the boys in my neighborhood. When I was in third grade, I'd come home and I'd have bruises on me. And my mom said, what happened? Oh, this boy hit me. So my mom got concerned. She went to the school and she said, why aren't you stopping these boys from hitting Kathy? And the teacher says, Kathy's the one chasing them and wrestling with them, and they're trying to push her up. <laughs> so I kind of relate that we all don't fit in a certain mold that people think we should. Amen. I am not a frilly girl, nor will I be forever. I don't really care for dresses, skirts, fancy clothes. I'm more pants, jeans, and top. And that has been all my life. I have felt comfortable with that. And my mom would always try to dress me up in these little girl frilly dresses. And I would come home with them torn here or there because instead of walking around the block to go to school, I crawled under the cyclone fence and get caught on it and ripped my dress. <laughs> they finally gave up. They figured out I was too stubborn to change. Today's reading is in James chapter 2, 1 through 14. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. A warning against prejudice. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into the meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry. And another comes in who is poor and in dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can sit over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgment are guided by evil motives. Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who loved him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, are you committing sin? You are guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all the laws except one is guilty as the person who has broken all the laws of God. For the same God who said, you must not commit adultery, also said, you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. So whatever you say or whatever you do, Remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy 
for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. I found a couple of stories that I really like and I can relate to. In Muhammad Gandhi's autobiography, he stated that when he was a student, he was truly interested in the Bible. Deeply touched by reading the Gospels, he seriously considered being a convert. Christianity seemed to offer the solution to the caste system that was dividing the people in India. One Sunday, he went to a nearby church to attend service. He decided to see the minister and ask for instructions in the way of salvation and enlightenment on other doctrines. But when he entered the sanctuary, the usher refused to give him a seat and suggested that he go and worship with his kind. He left and never came back. If Christians have caste differences also, he said to himself, I might as well stay Hindu. Casteism in India, if, if you're rich or born in a rich family, you are treated very well. But if you come from a poor family, you're always poor and you're treated like secondhand people. There is no place for discrimination of any kind in God's house. Whose house? This is God's house, not our house. Amen. Everyone is welcome here, Amen. no matter what. Amen. That Esher was a stumbling block for Gandhi. Several years ago, we had a member in our church, and She'd been trying to get her mom connected in a church, but her mom lived three hours from here. So she invited her mom to come down and visit her and invited her to come to church with her. So the mom agreed and she came down for the weekend and she came to our church. She walked in, walked up, took a seat. Well, a minute later, a lady comes up and says, excuse me, you're in my seat. I always sit here. That mother got up and walked out of the church and didn't come back. I've been coming to this church for 27 years. My name isn't on any pew in here. No one has a special seat in this sanctuary. Please never tell someone to get out of your seat then you're the stumbling block, and you cause them to walk away, thinking, if that's what Jesus' family's all about, I want nothing to do with it. As I was preparing my sermon, I came across this story, and it made me cry. I can't imagine anyone claiming to be a Christian to treat someone like this, ever. I heard a story on the radio about a note a waiter had received from a couple he had served at a restaurant in Overland, Kansas City. This waiter provided exemplary service to the couple, whom the talk show host described as Christians. The talk show host also said that the waiter was a homosexual. The following note to the waiter was written on the back of his check. Thank you for your service. It was excellent. That being said, we cannot in good conscience tip you. For your homosexual lifestyle is an offense to God. And you will not share in our wealth. And God does not share his wealth with homosexuals. We hope you will see the tip your lifestyle has caused you to lose and plan accordingly. It's never too late for God's love, but none shall be spared for homosexuals. May God have mercy on you. Do you see God in that couple at all? No. No. 
There's no love, no compassion, nothing in them to write something like that. If they were Christians, they would have wrote, thank you for your great service. God loves you. We love you. Have a blessed day. Amen. That's what God would want them to leave. Amen. And a good tip. Amen. <laughs> Prejudice takes all form of hatred. I remember my dad was put on the transplant list to receive a new heart. When we went to the doctor and he was doing an exam on to make sure he was healthy enough to have his transplant, the doctor asked him if he would take a black person's heart. I couldn't believe what I heard. I asked the doctor, why did you feel that you had a need to ask my dad that? And he said, there's still people here in the South that won't take anything from a black person. Where is the love of God that he has given us to share with all his children? God didn't say we could pick and choose who we wanted to love. God commands us to love all, no matter what. Amen. Amen. In Mark chapter 12, 29 and 31, Jesus said the most important commandment is this, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally as important, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Who's your neighbor? Everyone you come in contact with at your church. The moment somebody walks in this church, they're your neighbor. Amen. At work, all employees that you come in contact are your neighbors. The people that you live by. But some people say, but you don't know. One just got out of prison. The other lady's running around on her husband. Oh, there's a gay couple next to us. So? <laughs> You've all committed sin, and it says if you committed one, you've committed all of them. God loves us all equally. Amen. Amen. Doesn't like the sinful lifestyle, but he tells you, if I'm to reach my children, I need you to share my love with them. Amen. And you can't just share my love with the people that you think look good. You can live in a beautiful house. You can have the best car, the best dress, everything that most people want. And you can be so broken on the inside. How the house is so destructive in there with hate for one another, fighting constantly. And you can see a person live in a one room apartment that has nothing. They have more love and more peace than that person you think is well off and doing great. We can't judge by looking on the outside. And we gotta be willing to share God's love with everyone. I don't care what their lifestyle is at that moment, you're not going to change them. Jesus is going to change them. Amen. Amen. But Amen. you need to help them meet Jesus. Amen. Amen. People in a grocery store that you walk by when you're shopping, you see a little lady trying to get something on the self and second shelf, and I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> Get it down, and you see she's struggling. Go over. Get it down for her. Put it in her basket. Say good morning. Have a blessed day. You know, that means a lot. Sometimes people don't even get that in their families. Everyone here is looking for love. And the problem is that if it's your children that are looking for love, and you're not giving it to them, and the teachers are not supported when they see they're hurting, they're broken, 
and they're going to go down the street, and they're going to find love all in the wrong places. Whether it's a gangs that bring your children in, they see a lonely boy sitting on the side, and think, well, we go over and be friends with him, we'll pull him in. But it's the wrong message and the wrong kind of love. Same with girls, they don't feel daddy's love at home, mama's love at home. They meet a boyfriend at a young age, that guy's spending a lot of time with her, making her feel good. It's the wrong kind of love. Because his intentions are not what she needs or she's looking for really. Pretty much everywhere you go, you can share the love of Jesus if you're willing. If you're going to be Christ-like and live for him, we cannot see color. We can't see rich or poor, dirty or clean healthy or sick, businessman or prisoner, male or female, skinny. I want to put healthy here, skinny or healthy. Because yes. when I was in Arkansas, I was my grandpa and my mom and dad and stuff. Well, my mama saw it all real skinny, okay? So grandpa would hug everybody, call my mom, sis, how you doing, and stuff like that. My other two sisters, he hugged. When he got to me, and he hugged me. He says, you're a healthy one. I said, mom, does he call me fat? <laughs> <laughs> so skinny or healthy, <laughs> the only thing we should see at a, looking at a person is that he's a son of God or a daughter of God. Amen. Nothing on the outside. It don't matter if she's pretty or ugly. My prayer is that people will judge me from the inside, judge my actions. Don't look at me to see, oh, she's heavy or she's this, or she always wears jeans or pants and she's never in a dress or a skirt. That doesn't make me who I am. I can wear all of that and be very ugly to you guys. No worries. So, Judge me by who I am on the inside and judge everybody else that way. Because you will run into people that you would think you didn't want to associate with and the moment they started talking and the moment they started acting with you, you would see how beautiful they are. The outer thing didn't matter at all. And God doesn't look on the outside either. He looks at your heart. He judges you by the heart. Because you know there's times in positions that you get that you say, I'm not going to do that, Lord. I don't want to do that, Lord. I'm not comfortable in doing that, Lord. But your heart says, yeah, you're going to do it. And God knows you're going to do it. It's your actions that speak louder than your words. Amen. Amen. It doesn't matter what kind of sin he or she is in. God loves them as much as he loves you. You're not higher on God's list or lower on God's list. You are equal to all his children. The only difference is we have started to allow God to mold us and to take all the sin out of us. But every day, we're going to fall short. Every day we're going to step in it. Every day we're going to say something we wish we could put back in our mouth, and you can't. Everybody's going to make mistakes. Everyone has sinned. We are called to love them and to share the good news with them. We're to help feed them, clothe them, take care of them when they are sick. Or when they're in prison, visit them, give them shelter, when they're homeless, but most of all, we need to help them meet Jesus. He's the only one that's going to change them. Amen. Why should we forgive them? Because God told us to. Matthew chapter 6, 14 and 15. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive your sins. But if you refuse to forgive, 
others, your Father will not forgive your sins. I picked out a few stories in the Bible that I that I enjoy that shows how far God goes out to forgive his children. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over, looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan smoothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged him. Then he put him on his donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man, and if the bill runs over, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, now go and do the same. That is what he's sharing with us. Jesus has taken care of all our sinful diseases and stuff. Jesus went to the cross to die for us, to take our sins away from us. Now he's telling you, go, show mercy, show love, and forgiveness. This Samaritan was hated by the Jewish people. And yet, he knew that. He still stopped and helped. How sad is it, it is true today. Some of the least in this world you would consider would stop and help you if they saw you hurting and pain. But we would stop to help them. Mark 1, chapter 1, verse 40 to 41. A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus begging him to heal him. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Moved by compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. So if we're going to proclaim to be Christian in Christ's life, and we come upon somebody that's hurt, sick, maybe laying in the street, and we walk over and we say, Ew. He's got sores. They're innocent. I'm not going to touch him. You turn around and walk away. You just sin. We are called to be Christ-like, and Jesus didn't walk away. He didn't say, oh, you're dirty. You're untouchable. If I touch you, I'm defiled. Then I have to remove myself, go through a cleanse. He didn't say that. He says, I'm willing to touch you. Are you willing to be uncomfortable and touch somebody you think is dirty? The other one is Acts 9, 1 through 15, Saul's conversion. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went up to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the rest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them both, women and men, back to Jerusalem and change. As he was approaching Damascus on his mission, a light from heaven suddenly showed down around him. 
He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you persecuted. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what to do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they had heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to a house in Judas. When you get there, ask from a man from Taurus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he could see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I heard many people talk about terrible things this man has done to his believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take the message to the Gentiles, to the kings, as well as to the people in Israel. Wow. The Lord is going to use someone who was trying to kill his people. Jesus tells us to forgive our enemies, and he set the example for us. We have no excuse to refuse to forgive others. If they committed murder and that, then you got to forgive them. Unforgiveness in your life, in your heart, only hurts you. Only hurts you. Because the person that you're angry with is probably walking down the street, having a good time, not even think about how upset or how angry you are with them. But it can cause a blockage between your relationship with God because you're so mad, so angry. I think most of us have gone to God and said, okay, I have a problem. You want me to forgive this person, but do you realize what he did to me? Not only did he hurt me, he hurt my family. He destroyed this. God says, I know. I saw it. But the only way you're going to be free from this anger is to forgive him and let go. Every single person on earth is a child of God. It doesn't matter what color they are, male, female, if they live in Iran or they live in America, we are his children. God doesn't favor one person over another. He loves us all equally. How can we love each other equally? How can we help change the way we treat each other? Two weeks ago, I married my grandson of the Mono Ray. And at the reception, I noticed two things. Her side was over here. My family was over there. There was not hardly any communication between us. Look over, smile once in a while, nod your head. There was no interaction. But I looked out on the dance floor and I saw kids from three years old up to nine years old dancing with each other, hugging on each other, playing with each other. They didn't see a difference in each other. They were enjoying their fellowship and their time with one another. I asked God, why do children 
go from being colorblind and not seeing the obstacles put in front of them to later becoming racist and not want to have a relationship with anyone. I don't understand that. We all as children played with everyone that was on our block, enjoying each other. How do we go from that to saying, I'm gonna hang with them, um, they're not my type of people, to actually even being afraid of some cultures? How do we get there? Racism is taught by the action and the words children hear from their parents, from the TV, from the news media, and our lovely government, the politics. I remember watching the Jefferson and all in the family off Archie Bunker. And I laugh because they cut on each other. They made jokes about each other. But the older I got, I realized it's not funny. For the people watching it that are young and don't realize this is a comedy you're watching, they believe this is the way they are. And so they put it in their little minds and their bodies and when they then they go out as teenagers and they they see things they would have never saw if they hadn't been watching the TVs or listening to their parents. One way we're we're all guilty, I've done this many times without thinking about it and not realizing that I was set an example for my kids or maybe even even hurt and walk with the other children that are different than them. When you're in a car and you're driving down the road and a car cuts you off and you're mad and you say, that stupid guy is so dumb and dumb, but you put his race into the words too. You taught your kids in the back seat. Oh, because he's his color, he's stupid and lazy. When you tell jokes that put another person, race, religion down, and your children hear it, they're too young to realize it's a joke. So they take every word literally. So the children learn from us how to be afraid of each other, how not to want to reach out and have relationship. And the only way that's going to stop, and we can start turning, maybe this community around the way our kids or grandkids think, it starts with us. Don't allow people to talk to you about somebody else and put them down and degrade them because of who they are. Don't listen to jokes. Tell people, you know, I've been there and I've done this, but I realize what we're doing is we're tearing down and not building up. We used to tell the jokes that the rabbi and the priest and the Baptist preacher came along. One of them always got torn down as being stupid, not smart, whatever. We need to stop. Stop that. I was thinking the other day, why is it that you can go into any Catholic church and their sanctuary is filled from every walk of life. And I'm thinking, why? Why is that we have a predominantly white church here across the street that's all black? Why? Why are we not coming together as brothers and sisters in Christ and loving each other. Well, after the, remember what the wedding was like and the separation and stuff like that? We're not relational. And the Catholic Church is a church you can walk in, sit down, listen to the priest, kneel, 
pray, recite, take communion, leave. There's no way you build a relationship with one another in the Catholic Church. People are okay with that. Not having friends, not being relational. But God causes us to be causes us to be a family. Amen. Amen. If you don't want to have other people in your life, how are you going to have help when you need it? How are you going to have people in your life to lift you up and to tear you down? Because the government and society will tear you down all you want. They're not going to lift you up and they're not going to pray for you and they're not going to talk to you as your own person. All they want is to pull you in, to oppress you and keep you down, to keep you from rising. Can you imagine what this would be like if we all loved each other? The church across the street, the church down the road, we saw nothing that would keep us from being your friend, we could take the government over. <laughs> we could absolutely change the United States and the way the government treats us and the way the government promotes racism. They do. Because one that talks really bad about the whites, the other one talks really bad about the Spanish, and all of a sudden, everybody hates each other. Everybody. But what if we could get there that we could actually change the government in the United States so we recognize everybody's a child of God, everyone is equal. My prayer for you is to, this week as you go out, everybody that you see, you share the love of God, whether it's with a smile, or how are you, or if you have time to talk to them, you're not going to win anybody to Christ that you do not make a relationship with. Because if you come at me and I don't know you and you start telling me I need you to lose weight, I don't know you. You don't have a right to talk to me about something like that. You become my friend and if you're really concerned about that and you want to talk to me, I'll listen to you. Make a point of making a new friendship this week with somebody. And the more we do that, the better this world is going to be. No more people will reach for Christ to close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. I pray that you help us not to see race or gender or how they dress, how they live in a shack or in a house. None of that's important to me. It's the heart, the relationship with you, Lord. And I'll pray that, Lord, you just lead and guide us. Convict us of our actions that hurt people. <laughs> Help us to be the child you have created to be from the beginning. That we would honor you and serve you and love you all our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs>